In this video, we'll do an introduction to tieback anchors. I won't cover everything here. It's too much content to fit into one video. So tiebacks are often used for excavation support. Uh, they're also used for slope stabilization. Sometimes you can put a set of tiebacks through a landslide mass and, and stabilize it, at least prevent it from continuing to move. Um, and they're used when cantilever walls may not be feasible, right? Where there's a limit to the height that we can build just a an unsupported cantilever, unbraced, or without any kind of anchors. Um, they become economically infeasible when you get to be too tall and it becomes cheaper to put tie back anchors. Um, another benefit is that when you install tie backs, you have this big open space inside the excavation. So you don't have to uh, worry about having all these braces in the way if you do a braced excavation. The tie backs give you a nice, really open workspace in which to do the construction of the other foundation elements. So the tie back consists of a number of components shown here. There's the, um, the cantilever wall itself. Usually that's going to be an H beam with um, modifications to the web and flange to accommodate the anchor. Um, usually part of the web is cut out and replaced with a, a tubular section that the tie back can be inserted through and then um, an anchor or a, um, a locking mechanism is in place at the facing to, to lock in that tie back during a tension test. Uh, then there's the tensile element, the tendon, and um, then it's grouted in place back behind the active wedge. So the idea is that we have to make the tie back long enough that it extends back into stable ground here and not within the, the wedge that would form without the uh, tie back being present. Um, tie backs are post tensioned, so every single tie back is load tested. Um, when we install the tie backs, we go out and tension them to a, a test load that's actually higher than the design load, um, often by 50%. So we know for sure that that tie back can carry the amount of load, at least at the time of the test, that is uh, going to be required for it. And so, you know, there fairly, they're pretty reliable in that regard. You're not going to get many surprises because if they're going to break or pull out, that's going to happen during the test and maybe not later on. Um, this is a diagram that kind of shows the components of a tie back. Now, this is a very, <laughs> this is not a scaled drawing by any stretch of the imagination. This is a very short tie back, right? Usually the length would have to be much bigger here. But, um, Anyway, here's the locking mechanism. Then this is showing like a bar tendon where the bar is extending back into the um, borehole that's, that's drilled through. Um, and then a key is that there is a length of tie back over which the tie back is not bonded to the soil. So there's a sheath around the tie back and there's no friction between or very limited friction between the, um, the tendon and the sheath. And so it's called unbonded in that region. And that's, it's really an important part of tiebacks because we want them to be pretty stretchy, right? When we do the load test, we want to pull and have actually quite a bit of steel come out so that when we put the locking mechanism in place, we don't lose all that tension. If we pulled on the tendon and it only moved a fraction of an inch, it would be very difficult to lock it off and maintain any load in it. If it's stretchier, you're going to lose less of that tension when it's locked off. So the unbonded zone makes it have it makes it stretchier it gives you um you know a longer length over which to integrate those tensile strains that sheath ends at some point and then the tie back is bonded to the soil through these this grout and so grout is pumped in here it, it can either flow by gravity in which case you're going to get a tie back anchor that's the same diameter as the uh the hole that was drilled to accommodate it or it could be pressure grouted too, like what's drawn here, where you're going to get a little bulb there. You can actually push the soil out of the way and get more, more grout in there and higher capacity. And so that's called the bonded length over which the tie back is uh, bonded to the soil. And then the unbonded length is here where there's the sheath and it's not bonded to the soil. Um, as engineers, we don't usually specify the bonded length. We do specify the unbonded length. So we tell the contractor, you must include this much unbonded length in the tie back. 
just so that we're sure to get the failure mechanism, you know, far enough away from the wall that the wall is not going to fail. But uh, usually we leave it up to the contractor to decide the bonded length and whether or not to pressure grout. What we specify instead is a design load and a test load. We say you must load the tie back up to this amount and then the contractor decides based on their own experience and equipment what they're going to do. Are they going to pressure grout and maybe use a shorter tie back or are they going to use a longer tie back and just gravity grout? There are times I think when engineers might want to specify a bonded length. Um, you can imagine that, you know, if, if an active failure could come back behind the bonded zone and might be of concern, then engineers may need to intervene and say we need also at least this much bonded length. But usually that's a decision that's left to the contractor. Okay, and then there's two kinds of tendons. There, there are bar tendons, like this one shown here, where this is basically a high-strength steel bar, like re, looks like rebar. And then it's inside of a sheath, and there are centralizers to keep that tie back right in the center of the hole that's drilled back into the soil. So as the tie back is inserted, these, you know, the borehole would be like that big and the tie back gets installed inside there. Um, so there's a steel bar in the middle and then in the part where it's unbonded, oftentimes there's some grease in there to prevent the uh, steel bar from having friction with the sheath. And then where the sheath ends, you know, there would be grout and the, the bar would be directly bonded to the grout and the grout would be directly bonded to the soil. There are also strand tendons. So instead of being a bar, a strand tendon is composed of a whole bunch of, of strands. So in this case, there's five strands, one, two, three, four, five, and each strand has seven wires, right? So it's usually woven wires that form these strands. And um, the strands are in this, um, also in a sheath, and there's a little apparatus in there to keep them separated from each other. And then that apparatus also has a grout tube in the middle so that the high pressure grout can be injected uh, after inserting the tie back. And so that these strands will get bonded to the grout, which then gets bonded to the soil. And again, in the middle, in, in the, the unbonded length, there would be some kind of grease in there to prevent the... Um, friction between the strand and the sheath, and also to prevent corrosion from occurring for these strands. So uh, let's go through a construction sequence, and I've left this blank kind of on purpose. So the first thing you would do is come in and drive uh, some sort of soldier pile. Often that's going to be an H section. All the ones that I'm going to look at today will look like um, H section. So you drive these things in. Then what you can do is start advancing your excavation down like this. And here's um, where we are now. And maybe I'll erase that one, right? So I'll, may, or I'll push, put a dashed line there just so that it stays in the notes. Whoops. Sorry, struggling a little here. Okay, and um, at that point, as you've advanced this excavation, you've got these H-beams that are separated by some distance. So what ends up happening is you have to put timber lagging between the, uh, those flanges of the H-beams and push them down as the excavation advances so that you can kind of span across in between the flanges and hold back the soil in that region. Okay, then once you get down to a certain depth, you know, first of all, every every tie back wall has to be a cantilever wall first, right? So you need to make sure that it's not going to fail just like as a sheet pile kind of wall before you get to the depth where you want to install the first tie back. But we've reached that depth successfully and then we would install the tie back through the um, flange of usually they're only they're not inclined quite that much, maybe like this. And then we would install the tie back and grout it in place. Okay, and then after that happens, we can continue excavating. So now we're gonna excavate down further. Then this one becomes a dashed line. Maybe I'll put the little soil thing there too. And uh, again, we would have all this timber lagging in there to hold up the, um, to hold back the soil. And maybe we would install a second row of tie backs at this stage. There's often multiple rows necessary, depending on the depth of the excavation. Right, and then maybe we'll excavate down to the final elevation here. 
and we can erase this one, draw some dashed lines, activate down there. Um, and then we, you know, we have more timber lagging going in and maybe there's a final row like this. Okay, and then um, generally we will um, do something to the face of these tieback walls. The solder piles and timber lagging, I really like looking at those walls, it's very cool. You can see exactly what's going on, but to a lot of people's eyes, those are ugly. <laughs> so uh, there, there would be some studs put in here and some, um, some kind of uh, drainage system so that you don't, you can collect water and get it out from behind the wall. And then there would be some sort of a concrete permanent wall put in place here, right? Permanent concrete. And if this is going to be visible, like say from a roadway, you're making this excavation and there's going to be a road over here. You know, a lot of times they'll do some kind of shotcrete artwork and make it look like um, uh, a rock formation or something like that. You've probably seen that before. A lot of the time there needs to be a little footing down there underneath that concrete wall too to, su to support it so that it can stand. Um, okay, then if we move on to the next one, we need to think about the potential failure mechanisms. And there are quite a few. There's a lot of ways that these walls might have problems. One is a tensile failure, right? So we've got the tendon in there and it might just snap. That doesn't happen too often because we can carefully design the steel tendon and we know exactly what its capacity is. And during the load test, we just don't tension it above that capacity. But if there's a defect in it, um, it could have a tensile failure. It can be a little dangerous because you've got a lot of force imposed there at the jack that's pulling on the tie back. Um, so you want to avoid that tensile failure. Okay, another way is that the grout might fail at the interface with the soil. So you'd get a pullout failure between the grout and the soil if the bonded strength between the soil and the grout is maybe less than you've designed for. Um, you could also have a failure where the tendon slips relative to the grout. So you're leaving grout in the ground and the steel is just pulling out around, you know, within the, the grout. Um, and so that's another kind of pullout failure. Um, you might get a flexural failure of the uh, soldier pile, right? So there are loads happening here. You put, you're applying a load with the tie back and then there's soil load reacting against that. And there are loads at the bottom. So you're gonna get some bending moment in the wall and you have to design that H section to accommodate that flexure. Uh, it's possible too that you might get a kick out of the bottom of the wall. This would be basically like kind of a bearing failure happening behind the tie backs. But if the soil is very weak down here and you don't embed the toe deeply enough, you might get insufficient passive capacity at the toe. You have to design the depth of embedment of the soldier pile to always provide enough passive capacity. And then finally, if the bonded length is not long enough, you might get this sort of active failure going behind all the behind the tie backs and it might fail. And for cases where this might happen, you might actually want to specify a longer bonded length, right? Contractor might opt to do pressure grouting and have a pretty short bonded length there if they think they can get enough capacity. And if the failure wedge goes right behind it, that may be a problem. So you'd want to coordinate with them on that. All right, and then let's, let's think about um, what happens to the earth pressures as we're constructing these walls. Um, this is, this is definitely a, um, a very statically indeterminate problem, right? It's, uh, it's not a problem where you're at a limit state. So you can't design for active pressure or something like that because the, the wall is not failing and then you're putting these tiebacks in and actively tensioning them and adding um, forces. So anyway, before the first anchor goes in, maybe you'd have something that looks like a sheet pile wall pressure distribution. With the exception being that, you know, this is nowhere near failure. You've got plenty of embedment depth. So it's going to be more like a laterally loaded pile where the pressures are just kind of going to oscillate back and forth with depth over this slender um, wall. Then we come in and install, oh, and the pressure will be something like less than at rest, right? Because the wall will bend a little bit during excavation. So probably between at rest and active. You know, if we were to sketch an active distribution, it might be like this, right? So you're going to be somewhere in there, depending on the flexibility of the wall. Then we come in and add tension. So we've got this tie back in there. It's been grouted in place long enough. Now we can add tension to it. 
Well, we're going to change the pressure distribution, right? It's going to be much bigger now because as we pull on the tieback, we're pushing the wall against the soil. So it increases above the at rest pressure and then oscillates back and forth with depth like a laterally loaded pile. Then we can excavate further, right? So now we've installed that anchor, we excavate down, the pressure distribution is going to change as a result of that excavation. Um, you may get more and more pressure deeper in the ground. Then you come in and install a second row and you get this bump up in pressure right in that region. And that can keep going on over, you know, as long as it, it continues down with more and more rows. So the resulting pressure distribution is not really a function of just the soil, right? It's a function of the soil properties, the construction sequence, how much pressure you're putting on the soil from the tieback. So again, it depends on a lot of factors. It's, it's not something you can just solve directly from like a limit state theory for soil. So these are the earth pressures that the Federal Highway Administration anchor manual recommends for designing tiebacks. Um, these ones are based on earth pressures measured in braced excavations. And there's no real reason why you need to use these exact earth pressures. You could always make them higher, you know, if you want to add more force. Um, there is, of course, a limit. You can't tension the tieback so much that you get passive failure in the soil. But as long as you're providing something that's bigger than at rest, you're not going to get much movement in these tiebacks permanently. So here's the, the pressure diagram, right? It's, it, as you recall, for uh, braced excavations in sand, we were looking at, from, from Ralph Peck, a uniform distribution, and the amplitude of that uniform distribution was 0 0.65 times Ka times gamma H, where Ka is the active earth pressure coefficient that depends on friction angle. Um, we recognize for tiebacks that because we're post-tensioning, that distribution is going to look different. It's not going to be uniform. We're going to get a big pressure right at the point of application of the load. So what um, the FHWA manual has done is taken the resultant force from uh, Ralph Peck's distribution function, there would be an H squared in there, and set it uh, a diagram so that it's a trapezoid with the same um, integral of that pressure diagram. So the peak of this pressure distribution for tiebacks is 0.65 Ka gamma H over two thirds and if you take the area, that's exactly the same as the area you would get from a pressure distribution like this that just had the 0 0.65 Ka gamma H. Um, and then the trapezoid shape is such that you've got a linear segment increasing over the top two thirds of H1, where H1 is the depth to the first tie back. Then you have this zone in the middle that's one third of H, where H is the full height um, of the excavation. And then it goes down to the toe and becomes zero at the bottom over a distance of two thirds H minus H1. Okay, that's if you have one row of anchors. If you have multiple rows of anchors, like this one is showing three rows of anchors, then you would still have the two thirds H1, where H1 is the depth to the first anchor. And then at the bottom, you would have a two thirds of H in plus one, where H in plus one is the distance from the last anchor down to the bottom of the excavation. And then it's constant in between and again, we, we set it so that this resultant force is equal to the resultant you would get from a uniform pressure distribution like this. Actually, it'd be a little bigger than what I drew, maybe like that, so that the area is balanced. All right, so I, I've mentioned this before. I just want to point it out again. The resultant of the pressure distribution for these tiebacks is 0 0.65 Ka gamma H squared. The resultant for the diagram that, that Ralph Peck suggested is also 0 0.65 Ka gamma H squared. So they've said, let's design tiebacks for these loads that have been observed in braces that, have, that were you know, installed in the Chicago subway. All right, when we go to stiff clay for a single row of anchors, we have a pressure diagram that actually looks quite a bit like the one that Ralph Peck recommended. It's a trapezoid. It goes from zero at the top to a constant uh, in the middle and then it comes back down to the to zero at the bottom and in this case the pressure is set the same as Ralph Peck's diagram so in this middle section right there the pressure is 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 times gamma H and this is for stiff clay right stiff clay single row of tiebacks if it's multiple rows you would just extend that pressure diagram down and uh, 
you know, have that trapezoid where the bottom is two thirds H n plus one. So actually it's interesting, the resultant of these diagrams is going to be less than um, what Ralph Peck recommended because uh, generally this two thirds of H minus H one is gonna be bigger than just one quarter of H, which is what he recommended. Although it's possible to get a bigger one too. It all depends on whether the two thirds H n plus one here is smaller or bigger than um, one quarter of H. All right, then when we go to soft uh, and medium clay, we use the pressure distribution again from, uh, from Peck's recommendation. So it's a trapezoid, but it does not come back down to zero at the bottom. It just continues vertically down. We have the tieback load here and the resultant force at the bottom there. It's important to include this R because we have to design the embedded length of the solder pile to accommodate that R. Anyway, we've got 0.25H and then 0.75H here. And the pressure is gamma H times one minus M times four SU over gamma H. And that M is an empirical constant. Usually it, it's taken as something like uh, one for medium clay and maybe 0 0.4 for uniform soft clay, but it's it can be empirically derived for a particular site. And we define soft and medium clay as having gamma H over SU as being greater than four. Um, okay, Henkel rec rec recognized a problem with this particular pressure diagram for the special condition where you have one undrained strength in the um, excavated soil, but the bottom of the solder pile is installed in a soil that's weaker with an SUB that is less than SU. So here we would say SUB less than SU. You've, you've tipped out your solder pile in a weak layer. And so Henkel recommended an adjustment factor to bump up the uh, pressure distribution by having the one minus four SU over gamma H, just like we got here with M equals one. But then we have this additional term that's gonna drive up the pressure based on how weak the base layer is. What is that undrained strength? So I think that's it for part one.